Hey, I'm Melona Minkowski, and you're watching HuffPost Live. Now, for many Americans, race is not just a black and white issue. In fact, multiracial Americans have become the fastest growing demographic group in the United States. And in a new article in The Root Beyond Biracial, when blackness is a small, nearly invisible fraction, author Janae Desmond Harris explores the experience of multiracial Americans and the relationship between outward appearance and racial identity. Joining us now to discuss this topic and share their experiences are Janae Desmond Harris, a writer for The Root, and three people profiled in Janae's article, Alexi Nunn Freeman, a lecturer at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, Zebulon Maletsky, a visiting assistant professor of Africana Studies at Stony Brook University, and Stephanie Troutman, assistant professor of African American Studies at Berea College. So hello everyone, thanks for joining me today. Hey. Thank you. Uh, Janae, why don't we start with you and just tell us what it is that inspired you to write this piece? Sure. Well, personally, um, I'm biracial. I have a father who identifies as black and a mother who identifies as white. And when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, there was just tons of, of literature and information advocacy around the biracial experience. Um, there was a lot of support for whether you wanted to identify as black or white or both or nothing. There are tons of um, celebrity sort of role models. Um, many of my classmates had the same background as I did. And I felt like that experience was interesting, but it's, it's largely been squared away, especially with the biracial president. What I thought was more interesting in 2014 was the experience of people like me when they had children with, um, with someone who was white. What would their children identify as, um, especially if the, the fact that they were black didn't um, show up physically in ways that Americans would typically recognize. I wondered what the relationship was between what you say you are and how you look. And I thought it could really challenge some of our notions of what race really is. Um, more than anything, I think it reveals that it's certainly more than just color. And you certainly found some, uh, you know, some great people to profile and use as examples in this conversation too. And so Alexi, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself too? You say that you identify as black first, multiracial second, why is that? And how does that then move on to this, uh, to this next generation of your, uh, of your children? Yeah, um, thanks for having me and, and for including this issue. Uh, it's really exciting, actually, I think, to those of us that are in this world to see it on HuffPost Live and, and Janine's work as well, of course. Um, you know, ever since I was young, my father, who is African-American, Italian, and Cherokee, um, he would talk uh, about what it means to be back in this country. And he would explain my heritage and talk about the sort of deep-seated oppression that black people face um, for centuries. Um, and he had told me, um, ever since I was little, and repeatedly told me throughout my life that once people know that I am black, even if it is only one quarter, that is what they will remember. Um, and I am only 32 years old, um, but that has absolutely rang true throughout my entire life. Um, and I think now there are more people who identify as multiracial, which I think is wonderful. Um, but for me, um, it's really important to understand what being black means um, and, and, and what structural racism is. Um, and that it, even though I look like this and maybe sort of ethnically ambiguous, um, I am black um, and I embrace everything about that, even if some people think, I think that I shouldn't, right? I, had, I have an easy way out, right? I don't have to. Um, but for me, um, that has just not been an option. And, and now I have a child um, who is the blondest, cutest little munchkin alive. Um, and I never thought I would have a child um, who uh, racially looks like a white male. Um, but he does. He looks like his father, who is a fierce racial justice advocate. Let me say, I'm, I could not be prouder of my my oh so white husband. Um, but um, my son, I think I, it's going to be interesting because um, I think I will certainly um, share the lessons that were imparted on me about um, about oppression and justice and equity, um, and I will try to shape the lens in which he sees the world. But I also have to be immensely aware that. I have had many privileges because of my complexion um, and haven't don't have the quote unquote typical black experience. And my son certainly won't, won't either, right? So I think he needs to learn what those privileges are, but how we can use. Uh, it looks like we lost Alexi there for a moment, but she'll be she'll be back. Uh, but I think you know we're getting the point by showing uh, the picture there of her of her adorable son. Now, Stephanie, uh, you also uh, have children. You also have your own pretty efficient elevator speech. That's what you told Janae. Uh, to explain your family when people ask about it. Tell us what it is. Yeah, so I consider my whole family, uh, myself and my children, um, we, I consider us to be mixed race. I also identify first as black. Um, I was raised predominantly, you know, in a white environment and around my mom's family. And my mom's side of the family is white. 
Um, so my racial identification kind of came later through interactions with um, peers. We did live in a diverse area of New Jersey. And then, of course, later on through literature and film and other kind of cultural, um, my engagement with cultural products, I became more aware of myself and my race. Um, as far as my kids are concerned, though, I think uh, my daughter has a white dad and my son has a black dad. And they have a very different relationship to their racial identity than even I have to mine. And so we're kind of negotiating um, three different ways of looking at um, who we are in relation to blackness. And I think um, right now, my daughter is 10, she's almost 11. Um, She identifies, I think, herself as brown and as a person of color, but um, not necessarily black, whereas my son is very pro-black. Like, so someone says to him, well, you're brown. Like his peers have said, made comments about his skin color being brown, not black. And he's like, no, I'm black. So, and I want to support him in that because I think that, you know, the, the whole point of these dialogues and our narratives and sharing our experiences, uh, you know, is about not only having choice at the end of the day, but about making space to really have more, um, more options and to see the relationships in between. Well, you know, I think it's interesting because I, I, people think about how they are supposed to approach this as a parent, but just seeing your two children too, Stephanie, um, you know, I wonder what is the dynamic like between them? You say that they both identify in their own ways. Are these conversations that they have in front of you amongst themselves? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so my kids are, are very uh, aware, and part of that I think is just because the environments that they've been in. So they've been, you know, in very sort of middle-class environments from a young age because I was in graduate school Um, at Penn State, and they went to daycare on campus. So it was very ethnically diverse. Um, And also the kids were just having a certain level of conversation. And it began when my daughter, you know, she was in preschool and she had a Caribbean friend and she had another African-American friend and a mixed race friend. And it was the four little girls all the time. And they would constantly be talking about their hair and their skin color. And you have a white mom, but you're brown. And I'm, I look white, but my mom is black. And so they, you know, they would have those conversations. And um, <clears throat> so we've been talking about this for years. And it's interesting to kind of follow the dialogue and see how their ideas about themselves sort of shift and change or what problems arise in the different locations that we end up in, which being in academia, um, we've ended up in Kentucky and now we're in North Carolina in the mountains. And so we're in very non-diverse spaces. Um, And so I think that some of those issues come up more as a result of that. I know that in Kentucky, um, people ask my daughter um, at school if my son was adopted or if she was adopted and things like that. And so that becomes part of the conversation too. Well, you know, I mean, kids are, are notorious for not having a filter. And if anything, yes. uh, you know, maybe maybe that can actually help move this conversation forward a little bit and actually force the discussion a lot of the time because they don't uh, they don't hold back in the same way that that I think adults do. Zebulon, what about you? Uh, you know, how does your racial identity or what how do you identify yourself? And, um, you know, how has it shaped your experiences? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, in my case, as, uh, as, as everyone can see, uh, uh, blackness is not uh, necessarily uh, automatically assumed. Um, and uh, there's a lot of folks uh, who, you know, sort of identify proudly as mixed or proudly as African-American who I think uh, sort of deal with that same issue. Um, in my case, I grew up in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, uh, at a time, you know, I guess you could call it uh, post-busing. Uh, um, uh, and during that time period, uh, uh, race was very much uh, a factor, very much an issue, uh, even, you know, uh, in, in major, major ways, like you know, decisions one might make about, like, which neighborhoods uh, to visit or uh, where you might find yourself after dark and that kind of thing. Um, you know, that's, if people are familiar with Boston's racial history, uh, there's a great book about this called Caucasia, which is uh, one of my favorite novels that kind of explores that. But uh, growing up in a place that's segregated and then identifying uh, sort of betwixt and between was challenging, uh, to say the least. Um, add to that that 
uh, people don't necessarily register uh, person of color or African American when they meet or see me. Um, and yet, uh, I related a lot to what Alexi was just saying before. My mother taught me from a very early age that despite that fact, uh, that society would always see me as black. And she was right about that. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's carried me uh, well, uh, you know, uh, through my life, that sort of, I guess, pride and identity uh, with uh, being African-American, uh, but also uh, being of the age to have seen uh, identities uh, expanded and more options for identity. Um, uh, a lot of younger people when I was growing up uh, who identified as biracial or mixed race um, dealt with painful issues and painful experiences around that. Um, I don't know how much it has changed. I would like to think it, it's changed uh, for the better now that there are more options uh, for identity. Well, let's, let's talk about that and, and the language uh, you used around this a little bit too, Janae. You know, historically, let's talk about some of the terms that have applied uh, you know, to people that are biracial and you, you, know, you point back to in your article to even the options that were there on the census from things like mulatto and quadroon. How has that changed today? Right. I mean, people used to have the option of classifying themselves in an official way as mulatto, half black, um, quadroon, one quarter black, or octoroon, one eighth black. Um, as Zebulon pointed out when I interviewed him for the piece, those were things that people really sort of just guessed and they weren't necessarily that accurate. And many years ago, they were removed from the census. Um, at this point, people have the choice to identify themselves as multiracial, which can encompass sort of all of those things, and it offers a lot more flexibility. One thing I think is interesting, um, when I talk to Alexi and to Stephanie and, and to Zebulon and to another man, Ian, who was featured in the piece, is that people don't seem to feel a strong sense of urgency about picking a label for themselves. You know, you'll, you'll hear Stephanie talking in a very relaxed way about how her children have chosen to identify. She's more sort of observing and, and letting them lead. There's no, um, I would say even less than a decade or two decades ago, there doesn't seem to be a, a strong push to, um, to choose one word to identify yourself with. It's more, you know what, this is up to me. We understand now that um, race is socially constructed, that you're not gonna go to a doctor and get a test that tells you what race you are, that no one can, can insist or prove one way or the other that you should be black, white, or biracial. And I think it's actually really cool that people are taking ownership of that and just saying, you know what, I'm gonna figure it out as I go along. And it might not be one word, it might be a paragraph. It might be different words in different settings. Um, Ian, who is not able to join us, um, is somewhat different than everyone else on this call because he um, he has a biracial black and white father, but he identifies himself as white a lot of the times because he feels that he's had the white experience. Um, he also identifies as mixed race. He says that's sort of like President Obama identifies as both black and mixed race, and that's what makes sense to him. So I think what's interesting about the current moment is that we're not talking about choosing one category, we're talking about um, self-defining in a much broader way. Well, so I wanna bring in, uh, you know, because you mentioned that, and you mentioned Ian, Janae too, here's a comment from one of our viewers, Molly Alexander Darden says, multiracial people I know and have known overwhelmingly identify with black culture, ignoring white. They have such a unique opportunity to bridge cultures. Maybe someday they will see value in that bridge. What's your take on that? Yeah, I do think people, um, see value in that bridge. And yeah, I'll let Lexi talk about her experience as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, Janae. Um, you know, I think that comment is actually um, uh, uh, a tough one um, because I think it's in a way sort of judging um, the multi how the multiracial person chooses to identify, which I think is what we're all sort of trying to fight against, right? And so why we, do, why we don't have to identify, we have our freedom, right? We shouldn't be forced to, to feel a certain way or to act a certain way because of how we identify. Um, you know, with that said, for me, um, while I do identify as black first, I have led my entire professional career. Um, and I think a lot of people in this in this call have as well. My, my personal racial identity has affected my, my professional career as well, right? Um, and I actually think that I do have a, have a unique way to um, to focus on issues of racial justice um, um, because of my experiences, but that doesn't mean that um, I don't still realize um, that sort of one side of me um, and the side that people kind of look at and ask a little bit, what are you, um, which I've been asked uh, 
say how to countless times in my life, um, still very much matters, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that I'm not going to work on that bridge, but it also doesn't mean I'm going to ignore um, that that my blackness and that race still matters in a traditional way. And that's what you know I think is at the heart of this conversation too. Is that it's so it's beautiful that people these days can choose and uh, you know and come to this on their own as we said in whatever timing they 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 want to uh, there are there are endless varieties and, and options and opportunities out there now but but I want to talk about how judgment does still factor into this uh, you know I mean Sebulon for those who are mixed race biracial you know for someone like yourself too you said that it's not a, a parent uh, at, at the outset necessarily that you have uh, you know, that you are biracial and that you are black. Is there ever a time when you feel like you are being judged for not being black enough? I mean, this is something that we've seen applied to even, you know, the, the current president when it was that he was running. There were some that wanted to negatively look at the fact that we had an African-American man that was going to be in the White House, and there were some that criticized him for being not black enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, just since you mentioned uh, Obama as an example, it brings to mind uh, several things. I, I think that um, <clears throat> what people end up finding is uh, you sort of make your way identity-wise and sort of like feeling uh, along in the dark sometimes because um, you're not, you know, one can have like a sort of preconceived notion about how race works and uh, how one should identify I remember in the early stages of the Obama campaign, um, they were saying things like um, uh, President Obama spent nine months in the womb of a white woman and, uh, and therefore was, you know, uh, able to relate uh, better uh, in terms of race issues. Um, and then obviously uh, kind of moved away, of way, way away from that. Uh, by the end of the campaign, we were hearing much more about Obama identifying as uh, African-American uh, because that's what registered with the voters, and that's what resonated, I think, with people's sensibility about race. There's a long history of uh, mixed race African Americans. Indeed, African Americans themselves are a mixed race people, um, and we tend to forget that sometimes. Um, uh, meaning, meaning that uh, you know there are various ways of being judged, and people have made that sort of say. A conclusion about me uh, at, at times uh, uh, the the not black enough uh, issue. Um, I think the thing is because of the historical construction of race, the way we have constructed race over time, and the way race has come to sort of be in a sort of commonsensical way. Today, we have this understanding that if you have any black ancestry, uh, that uh, one is considered to be black. Uh, and so there is that kind of, uh, I guess we call that the one drop rule. People sort of have, I think, a, a understanding, a conventional wisdom about that. And there's always been room within the African-American culture, population, people, whatever you want to call it, community, uh, uh, for folks like myself. Um, uh, and you may have to struggle a little bit and uh, educate <laughs> teachable moments um, uh, with, with uh, uh, other black people uh, about the diversity of blackness and the full spectrum of what African-American identity is and can be. Uh, and I think that Obama has done probably more for that uh, than, than anyone else uh, that I can think of in the 21st century as we uh, are expanding you know, options for uh, identity, but I certainly had my stories. I call this the mixed race experience. Uh, well, let, let me bring in. Coming from. Let me let yes. me bring in another comment here. This one comes from Blake Rowley, uh, and he says people often choose black, white, and black white race situations because of white exclusion, and it makes you the other. And there's a solidarity solidarity, excuse me, with siding with that otherness. Um, you know, and I mean Stephanie, considering, of course, you know the 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 history of this country too is it also just now that there uh, you know that there is a pride in embracing that part of your identity uh, you know and Zebulon I know that you had spoken uh, about this earlier with with Janae and with our producers too in that in the past there was something as being able to pass as white 
uh, you know, where, where that's no longer really a part of the conversation. Um, Stephanie, you have anything you want to add to this? I mean, I would just say, too, that I don't the whole, you know, I have also experienced, right, criticism about black identification or being black enough, et cetera. Um, but again, that that just does an injustice to, you know, our long narrative of blackness and the black experience and black identity. That's not I mean, I'm unwilling to sort of flatten blackness down to this narrow, you know, set of criteria. I think that the black experience is also highly dependent on other conditions that you're living in. So your social class status, your geographical location, your community, there's so many different kinds of black experiences. And I think that when we're talking about, you know, who's black and who's not black and how you act um, in relation to that, um, it really just does a disservice to the variety and the diversity within blackness. Um, and so I, I don't know. I think that for me, the identification, I was always, I always saw myself as mixed race. I was raised predominantly white. Um, and as I got older, the reason to identify with blackness, I will have to say part of it was um, actually inspired by, I probably was like a teenager and I was watching Oprah and she interviewed Halle Berry and Halle Berry talked about how her white mom told her that she could kind of be whatever she wanted to be, but that the world would see her as a black woman and that there would be, she would be treated accordingly. And so that she needed to recognize that. And I feel like that was sort of a piece that had been, that was missing for me, at least in my family. Um, the idea that no matter what I personally chose as an individual, that there would be social and political and other implications um, around race. And so, I don't know, for me, um, I always saw myself, um, again, as mixed race, but as I got older, I did, I, I have gravitated more toward a, you know, black identification. Um, and I do think that it is in part, I don't know that it's about white exclusion, but it is really about being aware of structural inequality and struggle and activism and sort of the things that I believe in around social justice and how that connects to sort of the history of the black white binary. And that's what, you know, it's, it's interesting to me too, just uh, looking here at, you know, the descriptions that we have written of all our guests and how it is that, uh, you know, that your racial identities have, have helped perhaps drive some of your experiences and your career choices. Uh, you know, I mean, we have, uh, we have a legal expert and someone that works on social injustice in this uh, in this regard. We have two people that are professors that talk about this. Uh, you know, Janae, this is something that you are choosing to write about. Uh, you know, Alexi, you also mentioned that your husband is someone who is, uh, you know, a, a fierce advocate in this sense. Do you think that your racial identity and your experience has helped shape your career? Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I always knew I wanted to work on um, uh, dismantling structural racism, which is obviously a lifetime, a century world, you know, job. Um, and it has absolutely guided everything I've done. Um, those conversations around the dinner table that my dad led um, very much molded uh, me into who I am. And they molded into me into finding the partner that I wanted to have, right? Um, I, I dated people of all different hues, um, but it was when I found the, the whitest of them all who, um, but who dedicated his life um, to working behind the scenes on half of communities of color, um, acutely aware of his privilege, that was the right, that was the right fit for me, right? Um, and I think that, you know, I was a racial justice lawyer um, uh, for a number of years, and, and now I'm working to sort of build the next generation of racial justice lawyers, because it is clear to me um, that there, we have a lot more work to be done, even if it, it's, it, it exposes itself in different ways than it did X number of years ago, it still happens, right? And I think all of us um, realize that, you know, class absolutely still matters and, and gender identity matters and all that matters um, and, and it needs attention, but race still also very much matters. Um, and when you have intersectional identities, um, race still um, uh, still can trump in certain circumstances, right? Um, so so I have absolutely dedicated my career and I really owe my, my, my father um, and the sort of pride um, that I grew up in um, to, to, to do that. It's really funny when someone mentioned watching Oprah. I grew up and I remember, remember watching Ricky Lake and being really frustrated um, <laughs> by, you know, um, the, the countless people that were sort of uh, unclear of their identities and, 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 and nervous about embracing being mixed race or nervous about embracing black. And I think that actually caused me to go more in one, the one, you know, the direction of saying, I, I feel very strongly in who I am and I, and I have a place in this world and I have a way to, um, to really advocate um, for, for equity and understanding. 
All right, I have to leave it there. But Alexi, Janae, Stephanie, and Zebulon, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so you. much. All right, guys, stick around. Much more coming up on HuffPost Live.